thank you. From the depths of our heart. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Lord, that every person that's here, those who's watching around the world, be reminded of the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that blood, Lord. We are forever indebted to you. This morning, we give you all the worship. You know, as every eye is closed, every hand is lifted. I want you to listen to me quickly. According to Scripture, it was more than 2,000 years ago that Jesus paid the price. But the Scripture says that one day for the Lord is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day. So in heaven, basically, this happened two days ago. It's still very, very fresh in the mind of God, in the mind of Jesus. So today, Lord, is very fresh in our minds, and we're forever grateful. We will celebrate this day, Lord. And we don't celebrate a funeral. We celebrate victory. We celebrate eternal life. And we say thank you. So can we give him one more hand of praise before we go back to our seats? And what I want you to do is I want you to go back and before you take your seat, turn to somebody and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, you have to say it like you believe it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. Come on, somebody, I say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I want to start off by saying if the world and some Christians celebrates Halloween, we will celebrate Passover. I, I, uh, I hope that there's a better shout than that. If, if the world can celebrate Halloween, we can celebrate for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, I want to remind you that we are not celebrating somebody's funeral. We are celebrating eternal life. I will tell you, there's no way, there's no way here, or no, no place in Faith City that you can escape the presence of God. I was running to the, to the toilet before the service started, and he got me in the bathroom. I wept. I mean, I wept bitterly in the bathroom. And uh, you know what came to my heart? There's only one thing that I am longing for. That's only one desire. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with good desires, clean desires, right? It gives you the desire of your heart. But if there's one desire that I have that, I mean, there's nothing in, in, on this earth that can match the one desire that I have is to stand before him and hear him say, well done. Good and faithful sin, that's it. I say to the Lord, the Bible says that in that day there will be rewards. I said, I, let my only reward be to see you. That's it. There's no other reward that I want but to see him. How many of you in this building love Jesus with all of their hearts? Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We love him. We thank God for his blood. Now, I would say this, that this is the most important weekend in a Christian's life. And for those of you that's here, it tells me one thing that you deem it important to celebrate what Jesus has done for you because he has done it for you I said he has done it for you 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 come on I, I sense his presence I want to tell you this there's nothing that can separate you from his love nothing no no heights no depth no nothing no angel no no human being nothing can separate you from the love that the Lord has for you and uh, you know as we celebrate this whole weekend of what Christ has done for us. I, I was reminded last night as I was busy praying about the night before Jesus had to pay the price. You know what is so sad for me is I was reading the scriptures 
the Bible says that he had with his disciples the, the last Passover meal together. And he said this. He says, the one who would put his hand into the basket first shall be the one who would basically sell him out. And Judas was there. Judas heard what the Lord said. And yet, yes, Judas. And, and, and you know, it's so beautiful. As my wife and I spoke on this this morning, basically Jesus gave him time to repent. Jesus said to him, repent. Just just turn away from it. You know, the, 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 the first person who puts his hand in a basket, he will be the one that will basically sell him out. And Judas put his hand out in a basket. Listen to me. If I was sitting around that table and I heard Jesus say, the man that puts his hand in a basket first will be the one that will sell me out, I would go on a immediate fast. I would say, I'm not hungry. Thank you very much. He puts his hand first in that basket. You see, because Jesus, Jesus wanted to save him and give him time to repent. And here's the thing. Now he's, he's going into the garden of Gethsemane where he's praying so intensely that we're going to read in a minute how his, uh, his sweat becomes blood. But I want to picture this story. Here's Jesus in the garden and he finds, he, he finds his disciples sleeping and he says, Listen, at the end of the verse, he says, listen, the one who betrays me is here. And as he looked up, there's Judas, and Judas betrays him with a kiss. And he says to him, do you betray the Son of God with a kiss? Basically, I want you just to think about this. The life of Jesus was worth only 30 pieces of silver to them. Follow me. That's just what the Bible says. His life was only worth 30 pieces of silver. To them, right? If you read the Bible, it says that your life is worth more than all the gold and all the silver. And now the Bible says this: that when when they came to fetch him to take to take him under arrest, all his disciples deserted him. That broke my heart. They left him, turned their backs on him, and ran away because of fear. How many times have we deserted the Lord, but He's never deserted us? No, you don't hear me. How many times have we deserted the Lord, and He has never deserted us? How many times have we said, I don't know Him? And you might say, Vessel, I've never said, I don't know Him. By your actions, you have actually said, I don't know Him. I've never been with Him. Are you following what I'm saying? Listen to me right now. I want to be branded as a fool for Jesus Christ. I want to be branded, come on, as a fool for the King of glory. Oh, is somebody in this house awake this morning? I want to be branded as a fool for him. I want people to look at me and say, Oh, that's, here's that Christian again. Here's that lover of Jesus, that Bible pusher again. Call me a Bible pusher. Come on, call me a Jesus stumper. My God, my God, my God. We will preach him and him crucified. Hallelujah. And now I want to tell you this, that we don't celebrate defeat. We celebrate victory. So I was thinking about this just before I'm going to get to the main message. So they ran away and they deserted him. In the same night, he was left alone. And then just after that, Peter denied him three times and said, I never, I've never met this man. Again, our lifestyles proves the same thing. Now I'm thinking to myself, that if you understand the whole gospel message, you have to understand this. Sin separates from God. Say, let me say this again. The book of Romans says this. It says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, sin pays. Sin gives a salary. That's what the wage is. A wage is a salary. And that salary is death. But the eternal gift of God Almighty is eternal life. Read this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to say this as most of you know it, but let me say this again that every devil in hell hear me and every person under the sound of my voice. This is proof that there's only one way to heaven. Jesus Christ is not a way. He's the way. There's not multitudes ways to God. There's only one way and Jesus Christ is His name. I want to tell you today that Hare Krishna cannot save your soul. There's only one name given through which a man must be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. Life eternal comes through Jesus Christ. It does not come through a man. 
It does not come through an institution. It does not come through religion. It comes through the one who laid down his life and said, it is finished. And that's the king of glory. So when God created man in a perfect state, man decided to go against God's word. And they sinned. And sin separated man. And so God had to make up a plan. What will he do in order to redeem man's soul? And according to the scriptures in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you can study this, how God implemented animal sacrifice. In other words, one, one innocent had to die so that the guilty can live. Okay, let me speak to you this side. Maybe you understand this. And innocent, innocent blood had to be shed so that the guilty can live. In other words, the lamb, the sacrifices that was made, they were innocent. That lamb did not sin. That lamb was spotless. Hello? But man sinned. So the scripture says this, that life is in the blood. And so in order for one man to live, one man or one, one living thing, blood had to be shed. Are you following what I'm saying? And the Bible says, so what the blood of bulls and goats has done, it has only covered sin. It did not take it away. Are you, are you listening to me? So the Lord knew that there had to be a better thing to do, a better sacrifice that will not just cover the sin of man, but it will wash it away like it never happened before. And through that, I want you to listen to me, the blood of of bulls and goats is not enough, according to the scriptures, to, to wash a man's sin. There's only one that's good enough, and that was the blood of the Lamb of God. Now, you have to understand this. I'm going to try to press everything in for time's sake that you understand. Where Jesus was born was absolutely prophetic. He was born in Bethlehem. Do you know in Bethlehem what they did? They raised, in Bethlehem, they've raised sacrificial lambs. So all the lambs that were supposed to be sacrificed in the temple was raised in Bethlehem. The shepherds that was in the area when the, when the sacrificial lamb is born, what they would do is they would go to look at the birth of the new sacrificial lamb. But Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem. And the night that he was born, the, the, the shepherds came to see the birth of the new sacrificial lamb. You have to understand God in his infinite mercy and grace sent forth his son Jesus Christ to, to be born of a virgin woman. And you understand that the virgin, the virgin birth is so important. Because if Jesus was not born of a virgin, it means that he would have been born with sin. And if he has been born into sin or with sin, he could not be the perfect sacrifice. Therefore, he had to be born of a virgin woman. Are you following what I'm saying? And I love what the Bible goes on to say. That the scripture says that he grew up in the power and the fear of God. And he obeyed the laws of God on our behalf. He was sinless. And he kept his record sinless. Jesus Christ was the only human being that walked the face of the earth that was without sin. I want to tell you right now, sin had no dominion, no authority, and no power over him. Come on, there was no stain of guilt and shame upon his life. But this is what the scripture goes on to say. That God took him who knew no sin to become sin. So that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. The, the Bible says this, the just for the unjust. He took all our sin, all our guilt, all our shame upon Him. All the sin that, you've, that you had to carry your whole life, Jesus nailed it to the cross of Calvary. Are you following what I'm saying? The sinless sacrifice that God placed everything upon him. What a price that he had to pay. The just for the unjust. Now he who knew no sin became sin. So that we today might become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So I've got good news for you. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That's who you are. 
When you see yourself as a sinner saved by grace, you see yourself as a victim. You are not a victim. The blood of Jesus cleansed you from all sin, of all iniquity. He raised you up, made you seated at the right hand of the Father. Shout hallelujah if you're here. Shout with me, I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Takes our sin, he nails it to the cross. Makes, uh, justifies us in the presence of the Lord. Now, you have to understand this. We get today on Sunday. Sunday's coming. But he has been dead for three days. Went into the underworld. Preached with the departed spirits. Took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Conquered death. I mean, death has no hold over you, no sting over you. Listen to me. If you die right now, if you're born again, you're not dead. You're more alive than ever. You're just changing addresses. You're leaving this world behind, stepping into a new world. Come on. And in that place, there where there's no more darkness, no more pain, no more turmoil, no more war, no more lack, no more loss. Come on. In the presence of the great I am forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Where we will be, we will be robed of robes of righteousness. And we will receive crowns, the Bible says. But we are not interested in those crowns. No, 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 no. We want to take those crowns. And and crown him king of kings and lord of lords i want to tell you there's a king greater than every situation greater than sin greater than sickness his name is jesus come on shout jesus in this house jesus every decision made at that night every decision you, you, you have to listen to this he went to Jerusalem to eat with his disciples the last Passover meal. Are you here? And not because he's going to Jerusalem just to celebrate Passover, but to become the Passover. John even says this when he baptized Jesus. He looked up, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I can take you back right to Genesis where Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac. And Abraham says, the Lord shall provide of himself a perfect sacrifice. He prophesied into the future. God will send of himself a lamb that will take away the sin of the world. And because Abraham believed, it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Now, think about this. The walk of Christ, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. The walk of Christ towards Jerusalem. Every decision was based on you. He said, if I'm not going, people will go to hell. People will live under the curse, under sickness, under disease. But I'm going to pay a price because there's a church in 2024. Faith City, there will be people on the 29th of March that's going to need forgiveness, that's going to need healing, going to need restoration. I want to tell you this. No man took his life. No man. He laid down his life. He gave his life. You know, so I want to show you this. I want to picture you this, and then I'm going to get to the main thing that I want to show you. So you understand the gospel. Why does Jesus, why did Jesus have to come? He had to come because sin separated. So what sin has separated, Christ came and he redeemed us, and he brought us back into a relationship with the Father. Now when the Father looks at me, he doesn't see me. He doesn't see me. He sees his son. He sees the blood. So when the rapture happens, it's those that's got the mark on them. You're going to say, what mark? Not the mark of the beast. Blood. That blood stain that's on your forehead. No, no, don't, don't kill an animal and put it there. God knows who's his. Jesus says in the book of John, he says this. He says that you are not. He, he spoke to the, to the Pharisees and he says, you are not my sheep. My sheep knows me. They know the truth. They love the truth, and they follow me. They do what they, whatever I say. So if you say that I am his sheep, come on, I'm the sheep of his pasture. You better do what he tells you to do. Amen? Can you say hallelujah? Now, I want to go on to tell you this. So that night when they took Jesus away, what the world, the devil thought this, he says, if I'm going to kill him, it's going to be the right opportunity now. Because Satan is stupid. 
Satan thought, if I can just get him on the cross, I'll kill him. God knew if I just get him to the cross, victory. Sin is defeated. Hell is defeated. Death is defeated. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus Christ is no longer dead. The tomb is no longer sealed. Come on, he's, he's risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Christ Jesus is the Lord of Lords. When he came to this earth, he was born as a helpless little baby. He's not coming back as a helpless little baby. He's coming back with fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. Come on, to conquer, to conquer, to conquer. They mocked him and said, he's the king of the Jews. I want to tell you, he's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Maybe you heard this saying before that the king of rock is dead and the king of pop is dead and the king of, but I want to tell you, the king of kings is alive and he lives forevermore. There's only one king and Jesus is his name. I think right now in heaven, there's some rejoicing. People rejoice us for the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Never forget what he has done for you. Now, according to the Bible, God is a God of covenant. Shout, covenant. One more time. And the Bible says that God keeps covenant up to a thousand generations to those who fear Him and love Him and walk according to His commandments, right? So what does this mean? A generation that loves the Lord. So you love the Lord, your children love the Lord, your children and children love the Lord. And up to a thousand generations, He says, I'll not take my covenant away from you. Now, we understand this in the, in the scriptures that blood had to be shed for a covenant to be made into effect. Did you know that the covenant of God is still yes and amen? Oh, help us, Jesus. If it's in here, it's ours. The covenant is ours. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, the covenant is mine. Now, I want to help you out to understand one thing that... I've told you this many times, so if you're part of Faith City, you'll know this by now. There's no such thing as a familiar curse, all right, or, or a bloodline curse. Okay, let me speak to this side. I'm speaking to the born-again people. A lot of born-again people ask me, you know, somebody at my work says they're going to go to a witch doctor and they're going to do what? Going to do what? Are you born again? No man can curse what God has blessed. In the veil they try. Come on. They, it's to no avail. All right. So we don't believe in bloodline curses. We believe in the generational God. Not generational curses, but generational blessing. Hello. Because when Jesus Christ hung on that cross, what happened to every curse? Every fam family curse, bloodline curse, every curse of sickness and financial defeat has been broken. It has been removed from my life. I'm no longer part of the curse. The Bible says in the book of Galatians that the, the curse has been taken and removed from my life. So what am I telling you? It doesn't matter what's happening or running in your family's bloodline. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are adopted into His heavenly family and you have a new bloodline. A new DNA. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So you don't have to take your family disease. Don't be quiet now. Come on, don't use that as your crutch. You don't need that high blood pressure, sugar, diabetes, all that rubbish. It has been placed under your feet. The blood of Jesus squashed it. Can you say amen? amen. Now, funny enough, before, let me just show you this. Passover happened in Egypt where the Lord told them at the last plague, He says, I'm going to take out the firstborn. Everybody, now you better hear me. Israel and Egypt was in the same area. God says, I'm going to take out the firstborn. The firstborn will, will be dead because of the last plague. This includes Israel's firstborn. Then he says, take a lamb. Sacrifice the lamb. Take the blood of the lamb. Put it on the doorposts. Then I shall pass by. In other words, if an Israel or an Israelite did not do it, the firstborn would have been killed. But because of the blood, 
Pass over. This means it should do what? So it will pass over you. It will pass over your house. Judgment shall pass over you because of the blood, because of the blood, because of the blood. So they sacrifice Passover up to today because of what God has done. He brought liberation, freedom to Israel out of Egypt. This is what Jesus has done for you. He brought your liberty. It was for freedom that we've been set free. Jesus died for your freedom. Now I'm getting to the good stuff. So according to the scripture, what covenant means is this. If, if myself, I'm going to take Francois now. If, if Francois and I cut a covenant, it means what's mine is his. His friends is my friends. My enemies is his enemies. You touch him, you have to go through me and vice versa. Are you following what I'm saying? He's got a problem, he calls up a covenant brother. And we never change our minds concerning covenant. We cut ourselves. We mix our blood. That's what they did in the covenant, in scripture. So they would cut one another. They would mix their blood. Oh, I'm getting somewhere. Now the Bible says this. Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. And this, this is the night, before they took, or the night that they took him away to be crucified. Now the Bible says this. I'm not going to read everything, so you can you can read this for yourself. I'm just running through this. In the book of Luke, chapter 22, it says that when Jesus prayed so intensely, did you know that the Bible says he prayed so intensely that God sent an angel from heaven to encourage him, to strengthen him, because of the agony that he had to go through. And then, so let's before I'm jumping the gun, Ash, please put on Isaiah 53 for me. I want to read this. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and is rejected of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, ourselves or our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, he carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So that night he's praying, God sends an angel to help. Angel comes to strengthen him. Right after that the Bible says, he sweat becomes blood. The translation says, his sweat fell onto the ground. Bang. And so what happens, you have to look at this from a medical standpoint. Why does sweat becomes blood? Well, medically, they, they reckoned that if you go through such a high anxiety level of stress, so severe that your heart can burst on the inside of you, your sweat becomes blood. It's right before basically a heart explodes. So the devil wanted to kill Jesus Christ in the garden of Gethsemane. But what he did not know was, while he placed the chastisement on him, it brought a covenant. The first covenant that happened, in the, it was happening in the garden of Gethsemane. Seven places where he shed his blood. Number one, garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus Christ made a covenant. Isaiah 53 gives you the answer. The chastisement, the severe punishment of our peace was upon him. So I'm here telling you today that you can live in peace if you are born again. Nothing should derail your life. It, it, it's so quiet here. I'm not speaking about Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley here. I'm speaking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He took the punishment, severe punishment on him. So severe that his heart was about to explode in, on his inside. Do you know why? So that you don't have to go through it. So that you can live in peace and in harmony. Come on, and in enjoying the strength of the Lord. Jesus paid it all. When you have a bad doctor's report, look, look that doctor in the eye and say, Doctor, the chastisement of my peace was upon him. I'm not going to carry this burden. My burden has been lifted at Calvary. Come on, somebody better shout hallelujah. The Bible says the severe punishment of our peace and our well-being was upon him. 
So the minute the drop of blood fell into that ground, a covenant was written down. The chastisement of our peace, he took upon him. <laughs> Maybe you hear me this side. I, I need to get to somebody's spirit, man, just for a minute. Forget, don't let your flesh think. Just hear me. The chastisement, that punishment that brought you peace. So it brought you peace and well-being. Why aren't you living in peace? Why are you worried about what the world says, what the world does, what the world plans? Our eyes should be fixed on Jesus. We should know that the Bible says, nobody shall pluck you out of my hand. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Doesn't matter what you go through. It has been paid. Shout hallelujah. We have to write this down. So every time you stress, you break covenant. It's not God that breaks covenant. The Bible says God cannot break covenant. It's us that breaks covenant. So when fear and stress comes and anxiety hits your life, again, listen to me. Everybody goes through different things in life. But here's the thing. If you know that you know that you know that you know that you know, no, no, that you're saved, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, what does all the other things mean? Okay, this is my, my, my way of seeing it. If there's no money in your account, my name is written. Can I just tell you if you're born again, for all the born again people, you are filthy rich. You, you no, know, you don't live in a one bedroom apartment. No, 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 no. My Bible says there's a mansion waiting for you. When you leave this earth, you enter in to a mansion. Think about this. Now, there's a mansion, there's streets of gold, there's gates of pearl, there's peace and joy. But imagine seeing him face to face, knowing I'm going to be with him forever and forever. I want to tell you this. I want to encourage somebody. You better hear me right now. You know, that day you would understand why you have allowed people to mock you and say bad things. My children, I believe this, with all of my heart in heaven will run to me and say, Dad, it was worth it. They called us names. They mocked us. They said bad things about us. But we are here. Look at Jesus. I can see Kaylee and Dylan. Daddy, did you see Jesus? Did you see Jesus? That's the ultimate goal. That's the ultimate goal. I want to give my, my, my children everything. But the best thing I could ever give them was Jesus. Knowing as a parent that they are saved. Oh, joy unspeakable and full of glory. How many of you is thankful that your children is saved? If your kids is saved, how many is thankful? It was worth it. So the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Now the Bible says, everybody fled, they left him. First covenant is made. I never have to walk in fear. He's got it. He has sorted it out. Amen. Amen. There's peace in my heart now. So how many of you is not living in peace? Let, let me see your hands. Be honest, in your church, you can't lie. There's turmoil in your heart. You worry in fear. Come on, no condemnation, no judgment. Just be honest with yourself. So what you're doing is you're breaking covenant. And the Lord wants to give you peace that you've never ever can understand. But you try to figure it out here. This is why you have to fight the flesh daily. I fight the flesh daily. And the flesh says, how are you going to do it? Shut up, flesh. Amen. You're not going to make shut up. I'm already doing it. You have to put your flesh on st under constant submission. So the Bible goes on to say in the book of, of Isaiah 50, when they took him away, after they questioned him, mocked him, put a purple robe upon him, and, and mocked him, the Bible says what made me so furious is when, they were, when he was standing and they questioned him, they started hitting him, slapped him through the face, hit him with sticks on the head, uh, they, they spat in his face. Now people say, how can they spat in the face of Jesus? I, I'll say this again. Some people's lifestyles prove that they spat him in his face. If you don't do what his word says, you're one of them that spits in his face. You know what? This church, they, they, this, there was not supposed to be any seats open in this building this morning. If people were serious about the Lord, people's no longer serious about the Lord, they spit in his face. They're one of them that says, I don't know him. 
Are you, are you listening to me? They would rather go on holidays and go cycling. But then they want to go. You can't even go to God's house, but you want to go to His house. My goodness. I'll die for Jesus. You, you, you won't die over your faith. You can't even go to church over your faith. I can't, I, I can't imagine the price that He paid. I want to give Him everything. Do you understand this? We owe Him everything. You know, we believe in tithing, but I'm, I'm past that. It's time that we understand 100% belongs to the Lord. 100% of our time belongs to the Lord. Nothing is ours. Everything is His. They led Him away, and after questioning, spitting Him in the face, hitting Him, the Bible says in Isaiah 50, um, or not Isaiah 50, rather, I want to, yeah, well, Isaiah 50, because I'm thinking about another scripture in Psalm that I'm running ahead of. But Isaiah 50, he says, I gave my back for them to struck it open. Now, I want you to understand something. The second thing that they did with Jesus is they took off his clothing and they, they basically whipped him. Now, I want people to understand those whips in the day is not what you see on television. It's not a Jesus that you see on television with two stripes on his chest. That's not the way Jesus looked. According to Isaiah, the Bible says he had no comeliness, meaning no form. In other words, he was beaten beyond recognition. Are you, are you listening to what I'm saying? deformed so in other words he didn't look like a human being if you study what the scripture says in psalm 22 he says he was opened up so severely that he could count his bones psalm 22 i'll go on on sunday on psalm 22 he says he cried out to his father and he says look at the dogs how they surround me i can count my bones so he was opened up so severely that you could see his intestines, you could see his bones, you could count it. Not because he was a sinful man, not because he did something wrong, it's because of what we did. And yet in our stubbornness, we still deny him, we still reject him, we still walk away from him. This Good Friday has become like any other public holiday, especially in South Africa. It's just another public holiday. This is not just a, another public holiday. We celebrate eternal life in this day. There is some other feast here around. I promise you it's packed to capacity. Singing rubbish. We've heard Francois. Yeah, I laughed so hard last Sunday. Franco sang that song, Bucky Boort and Bank. Can people write rubbish like that? But in any case, here we have the opportunity of saying thank you. Second covenant, when they opened him up, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, they gave him 39 stripes. That was the, that was the custom, okay? But if you look at the whips, they, they reckon, what, what scholars reckon they did was, at, on every whip, there was, there, was at, there was more than just one tassel. There was mul multiple tassels. They reckon if, they, if he received 39 stripes with all the different tassels that hit him, he received almost 500 shots. And on every tassel, at the right at the end of the tassel, there was metal balls to keep the weight. And they would put stone and, 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 and glass and stuff that would basically rip out the flesh. So what they don't realize is they gave him 39 lashes and medically they, it's proven that there's 39 root causes of all sickness. So when they tied him up, they whipped him and they had to pull out the whip and with that they pulled out flesh because this is where Psalm 20, 22 comes in where he says, I can count my bones. So they ripped out his flesh. But every time they whipped him, there goes the healing for cancer. There goes the healing for AIDS. There goes the, there goes the healing for arthritis. There goes the healing for sugar diabetes. Are you, are you listening to me? Every sickness and every disease, you don't have to carry it. It's time to go to the covenant maker and say, I'm exchanging my yoke for your yoke. If the devil thought I'm going to kill him. What the devil didn't know was there is provision for healing. 
This is why we will not back down on preaching Jesus Christ as the healer. He paid a penalty so high in value that gave us our freedom. This is why we have to believe it. You better listen to me right now. Stop looking at your symptom. It's not about the symptom. It's about the Word of God. Don't, don't move away of healing because you don't feel healed. He is a healer. He's only good. And you receive that. And you stand on the Word of God. And says, by your stripes, I am healed. I am healed. I am healed. Come on, the Declare with me, I am healed. Second covenant, that by His blood, now my body can be healed. God can take you at the age of 120 without sickness. And just take your spirit. There you go. Amen? Can you say amen if you're here? Then number three that I want to show you goes on in the same same chapter, Isaiah 50, I gave my back for them to struck and my beard for them to pluck out of my face. So they plucked out the face of Jesus. Now again, we look at movies that shows Jesus hanging with two stripes on his chest. But I want you to picture this now. He just came out of a garden where his heart almost exploded on the inside of him. Where he took the chastisement, severe punishment, so that we can have our peace. Are you listening? Then secondly, they, they gashed him wide open, beyond recognition. He had no formliness, no splendor, or no comeliness, no form, no splendor that we should desire him. So he basically was, the Bible says this, it's not me, it's the scripture. It says he was marred more than any other man. Of all the thousands they crucified and whipped and scourged, no man was marred like him. No man. And then scripture goes on to say, now they are plucking out his beard from his face. Now, I love what the, the scripture basically says, because there's a third covenant in this. When they plucked out his beard as a Jewish man had, his face bled. But there's a covenant right here. Tongue. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So in actual fact, I want to tell you this. You better listen to me. Satan does not have power over life and death. No, you don't hear me. God gave the, the covenant of life and death in your tongue. Not to the, the devil does not determine. The devil does not determine life and death. Life and death is in the power of the covenant of the tongue. With this tongue, the Bible says, people bless and they curse. It says, it shouldn't be that way. You should use this tongue to speak forth your destiny. Come on, you are the greatest prophet of your own life. You have to get up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, this is going to be the greatest day of my life. I'm walking in healing. I'm walking in favor. I'm blessed beyond the curse. You have to speak it. But what people speak, people speak defeat and they speak death and illness and, and, and this is not what God wants. God wants you to know that He paid a price as they plucked out His beard. He made a covenant and He says, listen, there's a divine exchange. Satan is defeated. He's no longer in charge of death. The power is in your mouth. Are you getting this? Don't speak the symptom. Speak the word. Don't speak what you see. Speak the word. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Imagine James says that it's such a small member, but it kindles a whole fire. With this, you can light up seasons. You can change seasons by your tongue. Say to somebody, my tongue is in covenant with God. Let's go on to the next one. Scripture says, they, number four, they. So we have the Gethsemane. We have how they scorched him. Then we have the next one that I want to show you. So this is number four. Is everybody ready? The Bible says in the book of John 19, they took a crown of thorns and they placed it into his head. So the crown of thorns, if you go again back, you have to understand some of these things. You have to understand history. They didn't just put a crown of thorns in his head, on his head. They squashed it into his head. Now, medical scholars reckon, because you have to understand, Jesus was 100% human and 100% God. On that subject, let me help you quickly. Jesus is not just the Son of God. He is God. 
Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Come on. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. He even told them, he said to his disciples, before Abraham was, I am. That's the name of God, I am. So he says, before Abraham was, I am. He is God Almighty. So because he's 100% uh, human, he had to go through 100% pain. The pain was not taken away from him because he's the son of God. He felt every inch of pain. Now I want, to I want you to understand what he went through is not because of him, it's because of us. So crown of thorns in his head, doctors reckon that when those thorns hits the skull, it swells up because of infection. So your, your, your head becomes twice the size of a normal human head because of the infection. Remember, marred, be, be, uh, marred more than any other man. So I was thinking about this. Where did Jesus die for us? The gospel says they took him to the mount called Golgotha, place of the skull. So when Jesus' head bled, what he was doing was signing a covenant. Ah. So he said, the devil is defeated. Now where I want you to defeat the devil is in the place of the skull in your mind. Because the Bible says when you're born again, what happens to a born again person? There's a renewal of mind. Your mind is now absolutely renewed. This is why the scripture goes on to say that as a man think of so easy. Can you say amen? So the devil is defeated. Say with me, the devil is defeated. But the place I need to defeat him, come on, is in my mind. Number five and six quickly. In the book of Psalm 22 again. Your Psalm 22 is the most powerful scripture, I believe, in Psalm 22. It's the mo most heartbreaking scripture too. But here's Jesus crying out to his Father. Because if you study Psalm 22, it's the prayer of the Messiah. Now, how many of you know that our Bibles, the gospel says this. At the end, Jesus said, it is finished. The Bible doesn't say what happened on that six hours too much. Because it was six hours on that cross. Are you listening to me? But Psalm 22 says, he prayed to his father. He spoke to his father. And I, I'm not going to read too much into this. I'll read on Sunday. But in verse 14, he says, I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. There's no bone that was broken in his body, but every bone was out of joint. Have you ever had a dislocated shoulder? A dislocated finger? All my bones is out of joint. Can you understand the pain of that alone? It goes on to say, my heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pochette. And my tongue clings to my jaws. Two reasons for that. Number one, first. Number two, pain. Pain that his tongue clings to his jaw and because he's thirsty. And then it goes on to say this. The, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. And then this is the one, number five and number six. Now, this is Jesus thinking about this. Think about this now. 33 years old. Paying the price willingly. But he cries out to his father. He's like a small boy that cries out to his daddy. If your child comes from, from school and comes to you, you say, daddy, they, they bully me. They say bad things about me, daddy. That breaks my heart because I hate the bully. I'll smack a bully around any time of day. Amen. A bully is a devil. Amen. Are you listening to I don't I don't do well with bullies at all. Amen. And so here I'm reading this and I'm thinking about this. It's basically like Jesus crying out to his daddy. And he says, look at me. All my bones is out of joint. And then he goes on to say, they have enclosed me. There's like a council of wickedness that has enclosed me. And then he says, they even pierced my hands and my feet. His father knew that they pierced his hands and his feet, but yet Jesus included it in his prayers. He says, Father, look, look, they pierced my hands and they, they pierced my feet. Can you imagine what had to go through that father's heart to look at his son? Let me, let me tell you something. You touch my son, you die. Amen. Are you listening to me? But here God says, I'm going to have to give up my son so that my sons can live. That's love, people. How many of you can... Give up your son right now to die in somebody else's place. I would say, send me. Kill me. 
but not God. God says, I'm going to send my son so that you can live. So here's Jesus saying, look at me. My bones is out of joint. They, they, they stand like dogs all around me. He's got pain. He tells his father that my, my tongue is clinging to my jaw. Can you imagine what's going through him? And now he says, look at my hands. They pierced my hands. Number five, covenant hands speaks on forgiveness. What covenant he made was is this. If you just simply come and you exchange your life for his life, what he will do for you is he will forgive all of your sin. Now, if you look at the Bible, everything this side is when you win the world. Everything this side is now being born again. What happens with being born again is simply this. The Lord takes the old nature, kills it. Okay, are you listening to me? All desires, all things has passed away. Behold, I've made all things new. Now he puts his nature, his character on the inside of you, making you born again. So anything before this side has never happened. It has been washed away. It has been swept clean. Now, as a born-again child of God, you'll stand before God from this side. What have you done in your Christian walk? This is why, did you know that Christians will stand before the mercy seat of Christ and your works shall be judged? It will go through fire. This means that anything that is not worthy of the kingdom of God shall be burned away. Shall mean nothing in that day. So this means that there will be people that will be saved, but they will have nothing to show the Lord. You'll stand before the Lord empty-handed. But I, we cannot. I said we cannot stand before Him empty-handed. He has done too much for me. I know. Come on. Nobody knows like I know what He has done for me. Nobody knows like you know what God has done for you. We have to give Him everything. Come on, I'm almost there. I'm almost done. I promise you, I'm going to let you go in a second. But this is, just, this is just too good not just to leave. The Bible says, number six, that they pierced his feet. My Bible says this, the steps of the righteous has been ordered by the Lord. That's a covenant. If you belong to the Lord, your steps are ordered by the Lord. Come on, shout, my steps have been ordered by the Lord. Number seven. Now, the Bible goes on to say this. It was prophesied many years ago, before Christ even came. They said that they will not break one bone in his body. So we understand that all bones has been dislocated out of joint, but yet not one bone has been broken. The one that I really, I prayed, I said to the Lord, Lord, show me this. Why haven't they broken any bones in your body? And this is what came to my heart. They could not break any bone in his body. So today, they cannot break the body. Your bones can be dislocated, but they cannot break you. Come on, for a mere moment you can go through pain, but you will be you will, you are unbreakable. Can you say amen? So it goes on to say that they had at 3 p.m. they wanted to, most of the times what they would do is they would break everybody's knees that was hanging on a cross. Do you know why? To suffocate them so they can die quickly. And so the Bible says they were starting to break knees of the people next to Jesus. Started breaking their knees. And then they found Jesus already dead. Now here's the thing. After Jesus prayed Psalm 22, at the end, speaks, one translation says, it is finished. So Jesus Christ, for six hours, took the sins of the world, the sickness, the disease, everything upon him. Then there's a mere moment in that prayer that he cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Do you know why he felt forsaken? Because for a minute, God could not look upon sin. He had, the Father is so holy that he had to turn away from sin. Now you have to understand something. Jesus became sin, did no sin, became sin. I hope that you understand this. There's a big difference. He lived a sinless life. But like a lamb that was supposed to go to the slaughterhouse to take upon him the sins of the world, Jesus took upon him your sin. So the father could not look upon sin. He had to turn away until the price has been paid completely. When Jesus knew that every cancer patient, every disease, every lack, every curse that, that, that sin has brought into the world was dealt with, he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. 
not to be continued. It is finished. And the Bible says, he gave up the ghost. Satan didn't kill him. The blood loss didn't kill him. He gave up his spirit when he was ready. Now when they came to him, they didn't break his knees so that the prophecy could be fulfilled that says no bone will be broken in his body. But then they took a spear and pierced his side. And the Bible says out from his side comes blood and then water. Why blood and then water? Because medically proven, if your body does not give out blood, it gives out water. This also proves that Jesus shed every drop of blood in his human body. There was no blood left. The book of Leviticus says, before you enter the holies of holies, you have to apply the blood, then the anointing oil, to get into the holies of holies. So what Jesus has done for us was, when they pierced his side, the blood was applied. Then water came out, meaning the oil is applied. Now I have access to the holies of holies. And when he died, the Bible says, the veil of the temple that separated man from God, was torn from top to bottom. Now, no, 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 listen to me. Listen to me right now. This is just, just dropped into my heart. From top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. This means God the Father was the eager one. He was the one that ripped it from heaven and says there will be no more separation between me and man. Are you listening to this? It was not from, it's not man basically that ripped it. God the Father ripped it from top to bottom. But did you also know that when a Jewish man had pain, his heart was broken, he would take his garments and he would tear it apart. This is the Father tearing apart his garment and saying, my heart is broken. And so this is a price that Jesus paid for me and for you. More beyond any man without form, without comeliness, no desire, nobody desired him when they looked upon him. Do you know this that even the soldiers gambled over his clothing? Now, if you study, I believe it's in the Gospel of John, they said they took his they took his inner garment, they cut it in four. But his outer garment, they said is too priceless, it's priceless, it's too costly. We can't cut it up. Let's gamble over it. As the prophecy said, they would. They would gamble over his clothing. Now, if you think about what I'm telling you right now, tell your neighbor, encourage your neighbor quickly, the veil has been torn. Say it again. So I want to I show you something. Now, let, 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 me, let me quickly get, get this quickly. Wayne, come here, please. Let me use you again. Come here. Let me use you again. So here's basically what happens if you think about this. So here's, here's Jesus. He always plays Jesus if we have. How many of you have seen Wayne play Jesus? We put hair on him, okay? Really, we do. And then he plays a nice part of Jesus. But here's Jesus now. Now Jesus is hanging on the cross and the father looks at his son. And I tell you this as I can just assure you as a father. Every ounce of the father's being wanted to send a legion of angels. And say, get my son. Destroy them all. But something is pulling the father. The more he wants to help, the more there's a pulling. There's a pulling. There's a pulling. What happens? The father had to turn his back on his son dying. Towards his son's living. For a moment... The son felt like the father has deserted him. But hear me. While the son felt deserted, the father was gathering. Are you listening to what I'm saying? While the son says, I'm alone. Look at my bones. They can, I can count it. They've, look at me, father. They've pierced my hands and my feet. The father had to look away, but he was gathering. All of them who belongs to him. And now, thank you, Wayne. Now, when he died... The scripture goes on to say this, for three days, now, let, thank you, let me just say this, I forgot this. So the seventh, the covenant that came out is that we have this promise. That the Bible says that when Adam slept, God took from his side a friend called Eve. The Bible says when Jesus slept on the cross, the translation meaning when he died, God gushed from his side a promise, a friend, the Holy Spirit, our helper that will never leave us. 
But here's the thing, while he's dying, God the Father, now I want you to see it. For many thousands of years, man was separated from the Father for thousands of years, right? The Father cannot wait to be reconciled with us. That he rips open up the veil. But while ripping open the veil, allowing us in, he's ripping actually like his clothing that says, my heart is broken. Because something significant is going to happen right now. Not only is my son took billions of people sin and sickness and pain and disease and death upon him. But now for three days, he's going to go into the underworld. He's going to go to hell. He's going to preach the gospel to the departed spirits. Come on, I'm speaking to somebody right now. The Bible says this before he ascended, he had to descend first. Peter says this in the book of 1 Peter. He says this, that when Jesus Christ, when he died, he spent three days in the underworld preaching to the departed spirits. The departed spirits. Now we can see this in, in both ways, two ways. Before Christ Jesus, when you died in God, you went to paradise underneath the earth. So Jesus went to preach the gospel to them. And I like what he said. I don't want to, you're going to hear some of this maybe on Sunday again, but let me help you understand this. You have to think about this. The, the, most of them, prophets of old, has prophesied that the king is coming. He will come, the Messiah of the world. But when Jesus went into the underworld, he preached to those departed souls. Then these angels in Genesis chapter 6 who left their abode, slept with woman on the earth, produced a giant race, and they are in the underworld in chains, in prison, waiting for judgment. Jesus went to them too and said, you tried to stop me. You tried to stop my bloodline, but here I am. I am the resurrection and I am the life. Then what had to happen over that course of time that Jesus had to take back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Satan had the keys over death, hell, and the grave. But Jesus took back those keys, went back to the departed spirits, and said, Abraham, here I am. And he opened up the, come on, he opened up those prison doors of paradise, and he took them out right into heaven paradise. Because the Bible says on the third day when he gushed open out of that sealed tomb, many graves in Jerusalem opened up with it. And those who were in their graves, they greeted their families and they left. Where to? To the heavenly abode. Are you understanding this? Very soon we're going to have the same event. When Jesus breaks through the eastern sky. Oh, hallelujah. And the rapture of the church happens. The Bible says that those who's dead in Christ, they shall rise first. Hallelujah. They will rise first. And we that's alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the sky. The same way as, they, as, as Jesus has experienced when he rose from the dead, tombs opened up. In like manner when he's coming back, tombs is opening up again. Can you imagine what the father had to go through? For three days, my son has to go into the underworld and pay the price. That was the first time, by the way, that hell experienced light. That was the first time ever that hell experienced peace. So the Prince of Peace is walking in. This is why I want to encourage you today to turn over your life to the Lord. There's no life apart from Him. You see, I want to take two minutes of your time and then I'm going to pray. You can sit in this place and say, my life is okay with the Lord. And I speak from the love of the Father right now. I'm not condemning any man. The Holy Spirit convicts. If you sit here and you say, my life is okay with the Lord, I'm asking you, according to whose standards is your life right with the Lord? You see, there's a scripture that puffled my mind a bit. When he says, many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord. They say, who are you? I never knew you. Go away, you workers of iniquity. You see, when you say the Lord is your Lord, it means that it's no longer your life. In actual fact, can I say this? You're not living your life. You're living His life. Or supposed to live His life. You see, to, to, to preach this without giving people the opportunity to make sure that your life is right to God would be a waste of time. Because it's the only one thing that we can take to heaven with is His people. You see, this is what Jesus says. He says, he says if, you, if you even just hate a bit, you, you can't forgive 
Do you understand this? That you're not forgiven. You can sit and have offense against somebody. You will not be forgiven. I want to tell you this, and again, I'm not hurting people's feelings, but stop going to church because, or, or let me rephrase that. I, I want to say it in a better, better way. A lot of people don't go to church because Joe is in church. I don't like Joe. So what are you going to do in heaven? I don't go to church because there's hypocrites. So why do you go to work? Stop going to work. There's more hypocrites over there. You have to come to a point in your life where you no longer live for people's approval, but as you live for the one who has called you by name. I, after reading all this and studying scripture, I said to the Lord, Lord, there must be more that we should do for you. We owe him our lives. We owe him everything. So listen to me. Grace is not cheap. Grace is not here so that you can do whatever you want to do and say God understands. God understands one thing. He understands His Word. That's it. It's His Word that He understands. In that day, nothing's going to matter. But this, have you had a physical, and a, a, if I say physical, it can be so real with Jesus. That it can be like He sits here with you, commune. Have you been one with Christ? Have you had such a, now you might say, oh yes I have. Now have you done what He has said? Because he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? It's time when we go back to the scripture and follow his commandments, follow his word for our lives. And say goodbye world, goodbye. Do you know how you know that you are free? The Bible says, whom the son of man says free, is free indeed. If you still have desires to drink, to cheat, to smoke, you're not free. To lie, come oh, I'm speaking to somebody, then it means you're not free. But when you come to Jesus, He sets you free. Come on, He'll set you on high. He'll deliver you. He'll change you. And He'll never think about it ever again. Now, you, I, I want to speak to somebody. There's nothing that you've done in your life. There's no darkness too, too dark in your spirit that the blood of Jesus cannot come through and clean it up. There's nothing that you've done in the past that is too big for the Lord to forgive. You can sit here and tell me, Vessel, I've done so many wrong things. Jesus has done so many right things. He has turned your wrong into right. Come on, he has, he has washed it clean. There's a new slate for you. But I believe that every time for the church to become eager for the things of the Lord, it's right now. Time is running out. Time is running out. There's no more time for playing games. I want to love Him with all of my heart. I want to do whatever He asks me to do. If you just know me personally, I hate this world. I, I'm telling you, this world is not home for me. I'm just passing through. And while I'm passing through, I'm preaching Jesus Christ. I'm giving people hope. I'm telling people that there's a better way out. Come on, I'm telling, I'm preaching that hell is still hot and heaven is still real. And if you accept Jesus Christ, everything is different. I'm not talking about having a religion. Oh, basically, I know my Bible. So does the devil. You know what's shocking? Satan goes to church more than some church folk. I, I tell you this for sure. Every Sunday he's in church. People are, <laughs> how can the devil come, in, come to church? I'm not going to answer that. Next week's Sunday, the church is empty again. <laughs> he comes in people. But in, in any case, we have to come, become serious with the Lord. You know what the Bible says? He says, be holy, for I am holy. Without holiness, no man shall see God. So grace, what is grace then? Grace is not an empowerment to live in sin. You know what people do is, well, I'm under grace, so I sin, and then I just ask for forgiveness. It does not work that way. Do you know the Bible says this? He says, after you have received the knowledge of the truth, Okay, what is the knowledge of the truth? That Jesus Christ came. He says, if you go back to willful sinning, there remain no remission of sin. He says, it's like you crucifying Jesus Christ all over again, trampling the blood of, 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 of grace and insulting the spirit of grace. So what does it mean? It means that with all of my heart, I'm going to have to cling to Jesus and lay aside all the filth of this world. Can I, can I say one more thing before I say goodbye? The Bible is very clear on this goes on to say now again you can't forgive means you're not forgiven you hate means you're a murderer I, I, are you here with me the bible says that no drunkard no fornicator no adulterer no thief no curvaceous come on 
no, no fear monger, no idolater shall ever inherit the kingdom of God. So what does this mean? This means if I say I know Jesus Christ, but I do these things. And even to go on, if you say that I, I, I believe in Jesus, but you don't do what he says, you don't believe him. So today is the day, today. I said today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day that you say goodbye, world, goodbye. So what I want to do is, we're going to, can I ask somebody to help me with communion? Do we, do we have communion? I want to hand out communion to all the people. We want to take communion on, on the Lord's day. You know, communion, I like to say that communion is a miracle meal. It works better than Bernardo's. It works better than sleeping tablets. You see, you see communion, the Bible says that we have to do in the remembrance of Him. When are we reminded of Jesus? Daily. Are you following what I'm saying? So what, when should we do communion? Daily. So take your communion. Jesus said this, He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. When we partake of this body this morning, we receive our healing in our bodies because through His body, He brought us our deliverance in our physical bodies. And when we take up, and again, this is juice. It's not, it's not brandewijn. It's not, what do they, what do they give? All brown cherry. I was in the church the one day that gave all brown cherry. I smelled it. Somebody next to me said, give me another one, please. I just want to make sure I'm pure. <laughs> so it doesn't purify you. It just brings you into covenant of the Lord. So no old brand, Sherry. We only give out the Niva Mister. Can you even imagine as, as they're giving this out? I'm just thinking about this. Thank you, my darling. I'm thinking about what the angels in heaven had felt that day when they saw Jesus going through all this. They were just waiting for the commandment. You know, even Jesus said that the night when Pilate questioned him. He said, are you king? He said, let me just quickly tell you, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. We are not of this world. We're just going through it, taking territory for the Lord. So do everybody have one? If you don't have one, lift your hand very high so we, the ushers can just see who needs I want to do it different. I want to ask you to think about what I said. What he, he did for you. How he had to look. How he could count his bones. How every bone was out of joint. How his tongue was clinging to his jaw. How he lost all of his blood. How his head has been swollen twice the size of a normal human head. How he was crucified naked. Before we take communion today, think about what he has done for you. Think about how he has taken your sin and your iniquity and think about today a divine exchange so what covenant is is what Jesus actually said in covenant is what's mine is yours Wayne can I where's Wayne if you're done please come here again let me use you again just keep your communion ready, okay? Did you know, just look at me for a second. Did you know that the Bible says that Jesus could not, you can stand next to me, wait. Jesus could not carry his cross. So they, they found a man called Simon of Serene and next to the road and they commanded him to help Jesus carry the cross. Now, I told you about covenant in the Old Testament. They would cut themselves, mix their blood. And so what happened was when Jesus was carrying his cross, he was falling, he could not carry it. They found Simon. Now he's Simon. And so Simon got next to him. And they carried the cross together. Are you, are you listening to me? So what happened was now this wooden beam is upon both of our shoulders. So what happened here was a divine exchange. What Jesus was actually saying, Simon, now my life for yours. This is what covenant is. Everything that is mine is now yours. 
every blessing is now yours. The curse has been removed. It's removed from your life. Are, are you listening to what I'm saying? A divine exchange took place right there. This is what the Bible says. Take my yoke. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, and blood had mixed because when you give your life to Jesus Christ, His blood now runs through your veins. That's covenant. So in other words, everything that Jesus died for is yours. Can we lift our miracle meal to heaven and say, Lord Jesus, we want to say thank you this morning for your body and for your blood. Lord, we celebrate today of the goodness and the faithfulness of our Father and for, our, for the Son, Jesus Christ, and for the Holy Spirit raising Him from the dead. Today, Lord, we want to take communion and be reminded of your faithfulness. First of all, we want to say thank you for giving your body to us. That by your stripes we are healed completely. That we have been separated from disease, from, from pain. And all of our well-being has been taken care of. We want to thank you for this. And Lord, as we participate and partake in this communion this morning, I thank you that your life shall spring forth in our bodies. That bodies shall be revived in Jesus' name. Come on, receive your bread. And now, Lord, we say thank you for your blood. The blood of Jesus that has bought our salvation, that has purchased our souls. Thank you so much, Lord, for the blood that has been shed. We know this morning it shall pass over us that no disease, no wickedness, no lack, no loss shall come near our dwelling. I thank you for your blood. I thank you for saving our souls. Thank you. As your word says, do not rejoice because demons is subject to you in my name, but rejoice that your names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Lord, that our names have been written down in glory. Come on, receive in Jesus' name. Now, just